coach of the Toronto Maple Leafs hockey team and anyone who uh, anyone here who's a, a college strength coach or a, or a team strength coach, uh, you know the demands in season and the time demands. So I don't get to attend, or I didn't get to attend a lot of conferences. I speak at even less of them. Uh, but when I was contacted by uh, Dan and Art and I saw the lineup of guys and what they were trying to do, I thought this is really exciting. So uh, I'm really happy to be here just selfishly as, a, as an attendee. So I was lucky to, to get a way to sneak in here as a presenter too. So. Uh, what I'm going to speak about today is energy systems development, uh, or what's typically known or referred to as conditioning for ice hockey. Uh, I'd like to uh, say, first of all, uh, that you know, there's, there's, I think it's important always to declare your biases and to tell people a little bit about yourself so that they know where you're coming from. Uh, I'm not a, uh, I wasn't, I didn't start out as a hockey guy. Okay, I was a, a college football athlete and a track and field athlete. Uh, I kind of became a hockey guy by default. So the things that I'm telling you today, uh, I originally used to think that that was a detriment or maybe uh, something that I had to overcome, but in fact it's been a huge bonus in my career because I don't have any emotional attachment to uh, any of the things, the, the systems of training or the types of training that I do. The stuff I'm telling you today is the, the truth according to me. Okay, I, have a, I do have a, a master's degree in kinesiology, so I feel like I have some level of academia in my background. However, the stuff that I'm going to talk about is, is what I've seen work to me, you know, works for me, has worked for my guys. I work with a variety of athletes. Uh, I'm not a physiologist. Uh, I'm not an exercise scientist. There's probably many people in this room and certainly there's, you know, many people around that uh, would know more about that than I do. So I'm not going to quote uh, research, uh, but I'm going to tell you what seems to work for me. Uh, one thing I want to do before I get into my presentation is talk about someone that uh, in the coaching community that we lost recently about a week ago. I uh, I came to know Charlie Francis uh, about 12 years ago when I first moved to Toronto and I'm sure that there's a, a lot of people here that know him uh, and you probably know lots of bad stuff about him. I, I knew him not just as a coach, I knew him as a person, as a human being. Uh, I've lost a, a number of people this year that were close to me uh, with cancer. Charlie was a great, great person and he was a pioneer in the field of coaching. A lot of the things that I'm going to be discussing today are ideas that were first sparked in my mind uh, by this guy right here. For any of the faults that you may know about him, you should also know that he was a great, great person. And as a coach or anyone who's involved in athletics, we lost a, a great colleague. So like I said to you, uh, you know, I, I know you're not here to listen to, uh, to the story of, of my life, but I think it's important because it sort of shapes the way that I view uh, this subject we're talking about today and the way I view all my training. Uh, I started out as an athlete. I had no aspirations of being a strength and conditioning coach. Uh, at the time, uh, you know, I'm, I'm 35 years old, so back when I was an athlete, there was, uh, in, in Canada anyway, the profession really w it was non-existent. So there wasn't something, you couldn't do that anyway, and certainly not privately. Uh, I wanted to be a football player, that was my goal. So I wasn't, uh, you know, very talented. Uh, so hard work and, and training was, was going to be my avenue to get to the next level, which obviously didn't happen, because I'm here talking to you today. So, but one thing that, uh, you know, through this process of, uh, you know, trial and error and, and, and trying to figure out methods of training, uh, at least it, it sparked in me uh, the need or the necessity to take a, an analytical approach to what you're doing with your training. When I was done playing, uh, I had, uh, when I was in college and I was playing football, I would go home in the summers and I, I trained with a competitive powerlifting team. So when I would come back to school, I always seemed to do relatively well in all of our physical testing, our bench press squat, those sorts of things. A number of the guys on the team uh, asked if, if they could, you know, see what I was doing or, or we, could, we could share ideas with training. So I had a, a small group of guys w within my own team and we had sort of our own little training group. You know, I was, I was the only one of that member of five guys that didn't go on to play either in the NFL or the CFL. So when I was done school, I was teaching high school and, uh, and coaching high school sports. And my four other roommates, uh, we all became roommates after the fact, but the, f the four of those other guys were all still playing either in the NFL or the CFL. And they started to call me up and said, hey, would you mind, uh, do you have any of those old programs that we used to do? And I, I said, yeah, for sure. So, I, you know, I would dig them up and i put them together. And I started getting them off to these guys. And in that process, you know, I was still training myself. Uh, you know, I, I, there's sort of that anyone here who was a, an athlete and now you're a coach, you know, there's that sort of transition period where you're still kind of hanging on. You think you're, you're still training like you're an athlete. So I was always still researching methods and, and what was the latest and greatest of training. So I started tweaking those programs. And... Before I knew it, you know, two of these guys that I was dealing with ended up playing in the NFL and they were making some money, so they were able to compensate me for doing that. I didn't realize you could do it as a business. Okay, I did, that was never my goal. I, was, I, I loved teaching high school. I taught everything from grade 2 girls all the way up to grade 11 chemistry and everything in between. I really enjoyed that. I just found that 
when I would go home at night, I would probably spend about a half an hour on my lesson plans for school and about an hour on my workouts for my guys. So I realized that this is kind of where my calling was. So I moved to Toronto, and uh, I don't know how many people, or how many Canadians are in the room here. Okay, so we got a few. So I moved to Toronto, and my goal was to become a strength and conditioning coach for football players. But uh, sooner or later, you realize, if, you know, for American people, you, you may not know that, but if you want to be a strength coach in Canada and you want to pay the rent and buy groceries, pretty soon you're going to have to start training some hockey players. So I sort of all of a sudden developed a, you know, a, a, a niche with hockey training. But it wasn't my background, and I didn't know the first thing about it. And I can remember the, the very first NHL client that I had, the reason he came to train with me is because I had trained football players. He had a cousin who was a professional football player, and, and that was our connection. And he told me, I, I told him that right up front. I said, listen, you know, I'm not, I, I've never really worked with, a, you know, I've worked with some kids, but I've never really worked with, a, with an NHL player before. So, you know, I don't, I don't really know. I'd love, to, I'd love to work with you, but I don't really know if I'm, you know, the guy. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not an expert in that. And he said, well, that's exactly what I'm looking for. I don't want to train like a, like a hockey player. I want to train like a football player, which at the time I thought was pretty cool. You know, this is, this is you know, 12 years ago now. I thought, oh, okay, that's pretty cool. So I had no idea what I was doing. I just trained them the same way I trained any of my football players, and the result we had was great. So I assumed that I found the answer. Hockey players need to train like football players. It's, it's easy as that. It's simple. Okay, there's my business model. So I started to get, to get, I guess, more and more clients that were hockey players, and I trained them exactly the same way, just as football players. Now, some of them had fantastic results. Some of the results were average, some of them probably not so great. But for right or for wrong, you know, that was sort of, I developed my calling and I, I began to work with a few members of the, uh, being in Toronto, I started to work privately with uh, one or two guys that were on the Toronto Maple Leafs and that was my segue into the job with the Leafs. Okay, so story of Matt. Why is that relevant? So when I started my job with the Leafs, I was obviously really excited. It came completely out of the blue. I didn't apply for the job. Uh, I got a call completely out of the blue in July one year. I had other plans. Every year up until that, I had pretty much, it's seasonal, you know, people that work privately with athletes, it's pretty, it's pretty seasonal. So I would be really busy from May to September. September to May, I had a lot of free time. So I was busy thinking about what am I going to do in September? Am I going to go on a trip? Am I going to take a course? I got a call out of the blue from the Toronto Maple Leafs, and that's a pretty big deal for people that are in the, in the States. That would be, you know, your equivalent of the New York Yankees or the Dallas Cowboys. So that's, you know, that's a job you don't turn down. So I took it, and it was great, but it was sort of like the... You know the old saying that there's the good news and bad news. The good news is you got the job, and the bad news is you got the job. So I, I got this job, and all of a sudden I was in full panic mode because I realized I'm, I'm a fraud. Like, I've now got the best job, in, you know, in my opinion, no disrespect <laughs> to uh, some, one of my colleagues here, but I've got the best job in my country, and I'm not even a hockey guy. And you've got to understand, like, not only, I mean, I, I really love hockey, and like, growing up I had a number of friends that uh, were hockey players that went on and played in the NHL, and I played a lot of road hockey, and I've watched hockey, but... Uh, if, if anyone has seen the movie Bambi, that's kind of like, if, if you can remember the scene where he's on, that's, that, that's a pretty good representation of my skating skills. So not only, I'm not, not only was I not a successful hockey player, I wasn't a hockey player at all, okay? And I'm not, I'm not a hockey training expert, right? So now I, I was kind of in full panic mode, and I thought, oh man, this is like, this is going to be a nightmare. Like, everyone's going to find out I'm a fraud, and I don't know what I'm doing. And uh, it's funny, I met with a friend of mine uh, who was, who was, my agent when I, was, uh, when I was playing football, he was my agent when I was coming out of college, and he talked to me about this guy named Doug Blevins. And I, don't know, is anyone, I don't know if anyone here has ever heard this name or recognized this picture. So Doug has, has, is widely recognized as probably inarguably, and I don't know how you'd say who's the best in anything, but arguably the best kicking coach in football. Okay, so Doug has cerebral palsy. He was afflicted with this from the age of two. So not only is Doug not a world-class kicker or a proficient kicker or a decent kicker, He's never kicked a football in his life. He can't kick anything. Okay, so Doug is pretty much confined to a wheelchair, right? He became the greatest, you know, arguably kicking coach in football because of his expertise that he developed through his own analysis of the sport. So uh, I remember this, this friend of mine sharing this with me, and that was really kind of inspirational for me at the time. And I realized that, in a way, just you know, just like Doug, and obviously I'm, I'm certainly not comparing myself to him because I, you know, I'm, it's, that's an unfair comparison. I've never overcome anything like this guy has, but. In a way, it's kind of, a, it's kind of a, a benefit, not a hindrance, okay, my lack of experience, because I don't have an emotional attachment to any sort of training. You know, I, I don't feel like this is the way you should train because that's the way I did it when I played hockey, or that's the way that, you know, that's what worked for me. There is none of that for me. So if I can find a way, you know, if, if I talk to Jimmy today and he tells me, you know, two things about training that are better than what I'm doing, I scrap it and I do that. I find it's actually much easier now, this is, you know, 12 years into it now, it's much easier for me to train hockey players because I'm not a hockey player. And there's two reasons, and, and, and this is a little different maybe at the, 
you know, amateur level or the college level. When I work with professional athletes, as soon as you come into the room, it's, you know, the, these are type A males, you know, the, the alpha dogs, they're all in the room. Right away, right from the get-go, and it's, and it's hockey, I've worked, I've worked you know, a, a little bit in the NFL and I've worked with some NBA guys and some other good Olympic athletes and strong, strong guys. So with hockey players, not all these guys are, are you know, maybe as physically strong as, as some of you are here in the room or as physically you know, impressive when you, when, you, when you walk in at first sight. But right out, right out of the gate, I, I can say you know, unequivocally, every single person in this room is a better hockey player than I am. And I'm pretty sure, I've never seen any of you play hockey, but I'm pretty sure you're all better hockey players than I am too. So it's not about that. So we get that out of the way first. I'm not telling you, you know, I'm not trying to be uh, better than you. I'm not saying that because I can do this exercise. That's why, you know, I, so it, in a way it actually worked with a lot of my hockey, with my NHL guys right off the bat because they realized, okay, this guy, this guy can't skate. He's not a hockey player at all. So he's not trying to, he's not trying to address that. He's trying to help me be a better athlete. Um, one thing that I think uh, o over the, the course of time and what we're going to talk about today is that ability, and it's hard, I know like as a football player, it's harder for me to work with football players sometimes than it is with hockey players because I'm tainted by, you know, the success or failures or the experiences that I had. You know, and I think sometimes this is some, something that, you know, a lot of us run into with when we're dealing with the hockey coaches, like the, the real coaches, you know, re the, the assistant coaches, head coaches, is that they spent a lot of time, and you think like anyone here who's been an athlete, you know the, hard, the hours you spent like, struggling under heavy weights and like running until you like you know I, I've done it I'm sure a lot of you have running until you throw up if someone came around and told you all that stuff is stupid it's it doesn't work at all it makes no sense even if they're right that, that's a really really tough pill to swallow because you think well no I did that man I put my time in I, I, I you know I, I spent the time I put the work in it's got to be right you know but I didn't have that issue and a lot of that I have to, to thank uh, this guy here Doug Blevins so one, these are the, the, the most important things you, I hope you'll get out of today's talk anyway. One, this is a, a, a quote that I use all the time, anytime I, I, you know, I do a presentation, whether it's for you know, regular fitness trainers in a gym, up through strength coaches. Why, you should always ask yourself, anytime you write a program, anytime you do an exercise, anytime you conduct a workout, why are you doing what you're doing? Okay? Jim and I were just having to talk about this before we came in. I, I'm pretty open-minded, and I know that you know there's there's a lot of guys in this room that I respect very very highly. I'm sure we all have very very different methods uh, of getting to the same goal. But I know that you know if if I had one of Chris's athletes in my gym or Daryl's athletes or Jim's athletes, and they came and they trained in my gym, the workout that they would write is is probably different than the workout I would write, you know, and maybe you like uh, barbell curls and I like dumbbell curls, or you like hang cleans and I like power cleans, whatever it is. But for the most part, I, I, I could look at that program and go, okay, you know what, I, I get it. I see, I see what's happening here. I see what they're trying to do. I understand that. Maybe not the way I would have done it, but that's, you know, that's why Baskin Robbins makes all those flavors, right? There's something for everybody. Um, but you should always be able to ask yourself, know, why did you prescribe that specific exercise? Okay, why? And this is something that, you know, as... as you know, again, much like, you know, in a different vein than Charlie Francis, but there's a, a guy who's, who's a friend of mine, Paul Check, and you can like, it, like him or love him, and there's pretty much no middle road with that guy. People hate him or love him. Uh, one thing that I have that I think everybody could take from his philosophy, garner from that, is that every exercise, you should be able to defend every single exercise you put in your athlete's programs, the number of sets, the number of reps, the amount of rest, right? I've been guilty of it. I still, you know, I still do it from time to time. There's things that are in your program that are probably arbitrary. They're just things you've always done. You know, you gotta, you have, of course you do bicep curls. You, ha you have to. What do you, you got to do something for biceps. So we do curls. You know, of course we do, you know, whatever. We do bench and then we do incline because that's what you're supposed to do, right? You do bench and then incline. Obvi obviously, everyone knows that. So take a look. If you get nothing else out of today, that's probably the best thing you can get out of today. Any program that you write, any workout you supervise, why exactly, why specifically did you choose that exercise sets and reps? Okay, time motion analysis. Uh, there's, there's people here that could speak to this on a, on a technical level or a scientific level to a much greater degree than I can. What I'm talking about is that no matter what your sport, no matter who you're coaching, you need to, you need to take a step back and get some perspective and look at it. Again, this was easy for me in hockey because I didn't care about it, right? Harder for me in football because I did care about it, but Take a step back and look and see, what exactly is that athlete doing? What is hockey? This is something, when I, when I did my uh, master's degree, my primary advisor, so the guy that I spent a year and a half with pretty much every day was Tudor Bampa. Okay? Again, some people like him, some people love him, you know, he's, he's old-fashioned, he's out of date, whatever the case may be. But one thing, again, an important concept I got from him 
is we would go and we would look at a football game as if you had never seen it before. He said, pretend, it's hard, it was hard for me with football, he said, pretend you're someone from another planet who's come down here and you're looking at this, you don't know what football is, so what is it? He said, the guys, they come, they stand on the sideline. They run out, he puts his hand, this was Tudor speaking, you know, in his Romanian accent, he, he put his hand on the ground, he smashed into other guy, two seconds, they wrestle, he stand around, 40 seconds, they do this three times, he goes stand on the sideline for five minutes. And I thought, no, that's not, no, because there's way more to it. There's way more to it, right? But from an energy systems perspective, that's pretty much all there was to it. So I started doing this for hockey, okay, and we did it on a very, you know, very, very low-tech level. Something as simple as sit in the stands, watch one guy. Don't watch the puck. Don't watch the goal celebration. Watch your guy. Watch what he does. Stop, watch, piece of paper, pencil. Okay, you can do it low-tech. We've done it high-tech. I'm going to share a little bit of the research that, that I did uh, when I was with the team. We did uh, dart fish analysis for an entire game. We had four people uh, per player for three players, forward defensemen, uh, analyzing you know, high intensity work, low intensity, medium intensity. All this was correlated at the same time with Sunto. We had, so we had real time heart rates. We had lactate taken before warm up, after warm up, before the first period, after the first, before the second, after the second, before the third, after the third. Before our post game, we had three different post game cool down or lactate clearing protocols. We evaluated everything, okay? So we did it on a high tech level, we did it on low tech. It doesn't have to be high tech is what I'm saying. So it doesn't matter. I've, I've had the opportunity, um, for the last two years I worked with a, a female bobsledder. Uh, I, I, obviously I, I've, n I've never been on a bobsled. I don't know anything about bobsledding. We, I did the exact same thing, I looked at the same approach, okay? I had her educate me about the sport, watch it a few times, break it down. The, the nuances, the technical aspects of the sport, much like hockey, if you need help with your stick handling and you're coming to me, you're in big, big trouble, right? I can't help you with that. Same idea, we looked at bobsledding, which is a much, you know, obviously a simpler sport, had tremendous success. This girl was able to set, she has, currently has the start record at every, every bobsled course in the world, won the gold medal at the Olympics in Vancouver, okay, and, the, and the, I guess the, her magic is her start time, her power, right? Which to me was simple, simple stuff. Once I understood what it was, okay? So that, that's, that can be the same, doesn't matter if it's gymnastics, uh, cross country running, volleyball, whatever it is, you can do your own time motion analysis, okay? And then the third most important thing, I would say, is to understand this concept of the specificity of training. You probably already do uh, understand the concept, you probably talk about it, I'm not sure how many apply it. It's the specificity of training as it relates to the neurological specificity, biomechanical and physiological, and they're all equally important, okay? So we're here to talk about energy systems training. Okay. People always talk about, uh, you know, again, if I, if I speak to a group of, of fitness professionals, the, the word cardio comes up, which is kind of a, a pet peeve of mine because everything is cardio. Like people ask, well, I, you know, I've kind of got a, a, a rap. I'm, I'm like, when I was in the NHL, I was, you know, way off on a wing somewhere. And the only guys really, you know, really I could relate to, there's a few guys in this room, and that's probably why they're here at a conference like this. And the guys like Jim and, and you know, guys that, like Cal and guys that, I would talk to at the college level because they because they got it, but uh, amongst a lot of professional hockey coaches, I was sort of off on a wing because I didn't do a lot of cardio. Okay, so the cardio to me is a, that's a big pet peeve. This is car right now. It's cardio. If you're sitting in this, if you're alive, if you if you're not deceased, you're in the room. You're doing cardio right now. Okay, your aerobic system is working. Your lactic system is working. Okay, so it's not a matter of which one is important. Do I? People will say, well, you know, I, and I've heard this about. Well, Matt Matt Nichol doesn't think that. Uh, the aerobic system is important. He doesn't think aerobic... No, I think it's, uh, it's hugely important. I love it. It keeps me alive. I'm breathing. It's, it's great. Okay? Is it, is it as important as, you know, as, as the alactic lactic? Well, it depends on what you're trying to do. It depends on what you're trying to accomplish. All right? you know, are we only working one system? No, it's, it's a continuum. They're always working. Okay? We know that. They're always working. They're always involved. Okay? So I'm not an anti-aerobic guy. I'm not an anti-cardio guy. Uh, I'm not an anti-fitness guy. I'm a pro results guy, okay? I like doing what works. Okay, energy systems, I'm not going to, this is not going to be a physiology talk, A, because I'm not a physiologist and there's people in this room that are smarter than I am and, and know more about that than I do, also because I think it's incredibly boring. Uh, so we're going to talk about the application level effect of it, uh, just, but we're going to make sure that we're all working with the same language, okay? Anaerobic, alactic, anaerobic, lactic, and aerobic, that's the language I'm using today when we talk about this stuff. Okay, nice fancy chart. Okay. Basically, important thing for you to understand when you look at all these, these lines here. I don't know how this works. I can't point at things with my finger. That's tough. I'm a bit of a hand talker. So, um, okay. Important thing to understand here, okay. 
If you look at this pretty purple line, ATPPC, okay, that peaks out three or four seconds, okay? Lactic acid system, you can see that continuum starting to peak out, you know, when we get to about 30 seconds. This is all stuff you know, okay, that was more for your notes than for our talk, okay? We're gonna, I'm going to breeze through this, okay, real quickly. Now, this is kind of going back to the, probably something I should have said when I, when I pulled up my slide about Charlie Francis, and this is a, a big negative on our industry as a whole. We spend way too much time arguing about minutia and bashing and slamming other people because they don't think exactly the way we do and they don't use exactly the same words that we do. Uh, you know, I, I, think it's, I think it's really, it's, it's funny sometimes and then when you, when, you, when you think about, you know, the passing of a great coach, it's kind of sad. Um, when I'm talking about like these, these, you know, one to three seconds, is it, is it two, is it four, is it 2.7, is it, is it eight, is it 11? Okay. Th that, that to me is irrelevant. The numbers that I've got here are, are a culmination of, of sources. If I had to give you one reference, I would say that my, my go-to reference for these numbers that you're looking at today right now is the uh, National Coaching Certification Program that we have in Canada, the NCCP Level 5 Guidelines. I'm an NCCP Level 5 coach. This, this was our, you know, this is the this stuff you study. I, I've heard lots of people debate this, and, and I'm sure there's people that, you know, if I put this on a website somewhere, they would blog about how they hate me and I'm a terrible person because I said eight seconds and it's really seven. Okay. Important things, um, th this is the key. The work to rest ratios, if you look at this, okay, and the second, and this is, this is the one thing, that, what it says, intensity equals all out, maximum intensity, all right? We're going to talk when we, well, a little bit later about this, but anyone who's watched ice hockey knows there are very few times w where there is any relevance in doing anything less than 100% all out or passive. There's not a whole lot of in between. Okay? There's not a whole lot of benefit to skating at 75% speed. Generally speaking, you're working at a maximum intensity. Okay? And, and again, we could argue, you know, ad infinitum about this, but generally speaking, you're working at a maximum intensity or you're gliding, receiving or giving contact, making a play. Okay? So in order to train your anaerobic alactic power system, the work you're doing must be all out and explosive. All right? Anaerobic alactic capacity. Okay, duration of the reps in your work should be about 8 to 15 seconds. Again, all out. Okay, these are all in your notes. We don't need to go into this too much. Anaerobic lactic power. Okay, 15 to 30 seconds. Near but below maximal. Okay, and here's one thing that is sort of a misnomer is that I think the, the near but below maximal should be a result of your inability to perform at maximum intensity. You should, it should never be your goal Anything that you're doing in training from an energy, and I'm not talking about weightlifting, I'm not talking about rehab, I'm not talking about hypertrophy, I'm talking about energy systems training. You should never be doing anything in energy systems training, okay, that is less than maximum intensity for hockey, in my opinion, okay? What about tempo? Okay, that's different to me, okay? Tempo to me is, is, is recovery, tempo to me is not energy systems training for hockey, all right? And that's, that's, that's my language, that's my understanding, that's what I use. A lactic, or sorry, excuse me, anaerobic lactic capacity, duration of the reps, 30 to 90 seconds. This is the really, really horrible stuff. Okay, anyone who's done this kind of training, very, very uncomfortable stuff. Anywhere from a 1 to 5 to a 1 to 10 work ratio. Um, near but below max, 10 to 20 percent greater than VO2 max. So right off the bat, anyone who knows me knows I don't do a lot of this training because if I was going to do it, I'm, 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 I'm big on sticking to the protocols. I believe, I'm not a, I'm not a technically inclined guy, what I like to do is look at the science, find what works, and then stick to applications. That's way too complicated for me. 10 to 20% greater than VO2 max, I, I really don't know how I would measure that anyway. I don't, I don't test the VO2 max of any of my athletes privately. I, I did do it when I worked with, uh, with a professional team. Don't do it privately. That seems like way too much work, so we don't do it. Okay. The aerobic oxidative system, most important point on here, it's always on. So even though I may have uh, gained a reputation as being an anti-aerobic guy or an anti-cardio guy, we do tons and tons and tons of aerobic work. When I have my guys out on the track, we probably spend 45 minutes warming up before we do anything even approaching maximal speed. That to me is aerobic work, okay? Bridging, you know, glute activation, marching drills, A's. We don't, we don't do B's for the hockey players. I don't personally. 
A's, all that kind of stuff. Okay, we don't rest. Okay, it's at a low intensity. We're continuously moving in and out of drills. Okay, if you looked at, if you analyzed the heart rate, okay, you would see that it's in an aerobic zone. To me, that's that's our aerobic training. Okay, we do a lot of my players. We do yoga as a recovery exercise. Right? To me, that's aerobic activity. Okay, Pilates could be an aerobic activity. Core conditioning could be an aerobic activity. I'm not anti-aerobic. I'm I'm big on specificity. Okay, it's always on. Okay, so when you are recovering from a hard alactic or a hard lactic set of work, your aerobic system is challenged. Right, you're always working. Okay, this is probably the most important question now. So after we've said all that, you know it's important to say why am I doing what I'm doing. You know it's important to take a step back, get some perspective on your sport, which I'm assuming for everybody because you're here at 8 o'clock in the morning is hockey. All right? What is hockey? All right? Remember my story about my, my hockey player coming to me 12 years ago and saying, I don't want to train like a hockey player, I want to train like a football player. Okay? Which I thought was cool at the time and now I think is very uncool because it's, kind of a, a, it's a sad statement about the state of affairs in our business because you should want to train like a hockey player. Right? So what is hockey though? How, you can't know how to train for something if you don't know what exactly your sport is. So I, I looked at, okay, my, this is my average clientele. Okay, I have, a, I have a very small clientele of guys that I work with now. I have some guys, you know, a couple of the, the big, big, big names in the sport, high, high end guys. I've got some, you know, journeyman guys that are making league minimum, just grinding their way through. I've got guys that play 25 minutes a night, 82 games a year. I've got guys that play six minutes a night whenever they get in the lineup, all right? And everything in between. On average, this is representative of the guys that I train in the NHL, okay? So over the course, on an NHL game night, over the course of two and a half hours, they're going to play three periods of hockey. Total time on the ice, okay? And this is easy stuff to find out, it's, it, which is a huge benefit for me working with NHL players. I can go to NHL.com and I can find out exactly how, minutes, uh, how many minutes they played every single night. I can find out exactly how many shifts they had. It's awesome, okay? Uh, this is it's, that's the hugest benefit to a strength coach. All that data is right there for you. So in terms of figuring out what's the work to rest ratio representative of what my athlete is doing, it's all instantly available for you, you know, literally seconds after the game is over. So 17 minutes of total time on the ice, okay? That includes standing around, gliding, trash talking, uh, you know, looking for the puck, skating as hard as you can, you know, doing nothing, shooting, passing, everything. If they're on the ice and the clock is running, that's what that count says, okay? Typically that's divided into 22 shifts. Again, this is not a standard for everybody, this is a standard for my guys, an average. An average of 42 seconds per shift. Okay, so if we break this down, this is sort of where, if I look at the evolution of hockey training just in the time that I've been working with hockey players, it used to be this uh, concept of well, the game is, you know, uh, there's, you know, the game is over the course of two hours. It's a long game, so we need a huge base of aerobic fitness to last throughout this entire game. And it's divided up into three 20 minutes. I've even seen, I've seen training programs, believe it or not, at the, at the professional level, with three 20-minute bouts of aerobic power intervals because there's three 20-minute periods of hockey. Okay, which at least is a little bit, it, it's a little bit more specific than, it's a little bit more specific than go ride the bike for 30 minutes, but not much. So then, then there sort of became this idea that, well, a shift is generally about 45 seconds long, so we need to do 45 second intervals so that you can go all out for the entire shift. Okay, it's a really nice idea, it doesn't work, doesn't happen, okay. There is no benefit to skating like this for 45 seconds, okay? You have to remember that there's a puck involved, there's teammates involved, there's stops in play, all right? Even if you were physically capable of doing that, okay, even if you were somehow able to dope yourself up to the point where you could drive your anaerobic alactic system for 45 seconds and go all out, there is no actual benefit to doing that, all right? Average, within that average shift, okay, so that average 42 second shift is a series of two to three second bouts of maximum intensity work. Okay, again, this, I don't want to say this is true for everybody, but this is also not my opinion. Okay, this is all, this is when we looked at dartfish plus Sunto, real time heart rate, plus lactate, plus time motion analysis. Okay, this is what we got, right? Four to seven sets, okay, or four to seven reps, however you want to look at it, of two to three seconds of work. Okay, 
each two to three second acceleration is obviously going to be coupled with you know, a, a two to three second deceleration change in direction. Giving and receiving contact obviously is, is something you have to prepare for. There's both active and passive recovery. Right? One of the really important points to look at, uh, a guy by the name of Mike Bracco out of Calgary did, did some, uh, I, I, don't, I don't believe he ever published it, he may have. This is all from a, a personal discussion that we had seven years ago. He had done a number of time motion analysis and what he determined is that the players that score most, okay, the most successful players when success is defined as scoring, spend more time on two skates than one skate. Okay? This is, again is a big, this, this is getting away from energy system training, but this can be a big debate. People will say, well, you know, uh, you know hockey, you, you spend all your time on one leg. Or any team sport athlete, you're, you're a sprinter, all the time is spent on one leg, so you only need to do one leg training. Well, actually, in, in, in real fact, if you, if you, that, that's great. Don't take anybody, don't take my word for anything I'm saying either today. Go check it out yourself. But when you do check it out yourself, what you're going to find is that guys that score most often spend more time gliding around, and anyone who works in hockey can tell you, spend more time gliding around on two skates waiting for opportunities than they do actually skating to create opportunities. Right? Now, does that mean everybody should train like that? No, there's a role for everybody. Okay? There's some people that are, uh, are, are grinders, they're workers, they're not going to score more. Maybe that's the, the way you have to train an athlete like that. Maybe they need to spend more time doing single leg training for a guy like that. Maybe they need to spend more time you know, in the uh, lactic power category if they're a player like that. Maybe, you shouldn't, maybe it's not realistic to try to turn chicken shit into chicken stew. I don't know. But for the most part, this is what you're going to see. Okay? Now, when I first started in the NHL, you have to remember, like, my background, again, is track and field and football. You know, I played a whole bunch of sports. I love basketball. I'm just, I'm a little bit vertically challenged to, to get to the next level, and my skill was obviously limited, so I wasn't going to go anywhere there, but I really enjoyed it. Uh, but my background, again, was, was football and track. So for me, energy systems training as an athlete was done on the track or on the field. When I started running my business, uh, I ran my business for three years out of a large track and field center, uh, York University in Toronto, that's where I, I met Charlie. We did have one bike, it was a Monarch bike, I think it might have been the first one they ever made. It was, it was more brown than it was white with, with rust, but there was a bike, so if you wanted to ride a bike, there was one back in the corner that you could get on, okay? and, but the seat was broken, so if you had to be like 5'11 to 6'5", you know, you were good, otherwise forget about it. So when I first took my job you know, working in the NHL, I saw everybody was riding bikes. And again, back to my whole thing about me, you know, perceiving myself to be a fraud because I'm not a hockey guy. Now I've got this primo job in the league. I thought, holy shit, I, I, everyone's riding bikes. I don't know what this is all about. I'm not sure wh what the reason is, but I better find out and I better come up with some bike rides because I don't want to be the only guy who's not prescribing bike rides for all my guys because obviously, obviously it must be the right thing to do because everybody's doing it. So I, I, tried to, I, I was calling around and asking people, I was saying, okay, what's, you know, asking, you know, kind of my circle of trusted you know, mentors and resources about what, what's the deal with everybody riding the bike. I genuinely, I genuinely didn't know because it's not something I ever did. And, but again, I had a small group of NHL clients. I had a lot of football players. But, so maybe you need to for hockey. So what, I guess the, the concept that I got from a lot of people was that they would do a lot in the summer and they would do a lot of bike riding to build this base of fitness. But then you need to ride the bike after games in season to clear lactate. And I thought, oh, okay, that makes sense. Uh, it makes sense to me. We need to clear this lactate. So, so for my first year in the NHL, I, I prescribed bike rides for these guys. I prescribed rides that other people told me were good because that's what they do in Ottawa, and that, or that's what they do in Pittsburgh, or that's what they do in Vancouver, or that's what they do in whatever. So I just said, okay, good enough for me. But it never really sat right with me, and it didn't make a lot of sense. But I, I didn't have, again, I'm, I'm a biomechanics guy first and, and foremost, not a physiology guy. So I spent that entire off-season looking into this exact subject and figuring out what exactly is happening and how, how are we clearing lactate by riding this bike. And some of the, some of the ideas made sense to me, some of them didn't. So I, I decided this is something, like, again, like the time motion analysis that I had to look into. So we began to do some research. I started first just with a lactate pro measuring lactates on my own, you know, before the workout, after the workout, during the workout. You know, I didn't really know what I was doing at first. Numbers didn't really make any sense to me, but it was data. I took the data. I started taking it to the next level, and then between 2004 and 2006, I really spent a lot of time looking into this idea, because anyone who's worked in hockey will know, guys will tell you, 
after a hard shift, oh, my, you know, my legs are just full of lactate. I'm burning, my legs are burning. There's so much lactate. I've got to get the lactate out. You know, coaches will tell you that they need to bag skate their guys to get them used to handling all this lactate. Well, the funny thing is, so we looked into this, and then uh, two of my colleagues, Dave Sandler and Ed McNeely, we, we spent for a year, we analyzed a number of games and a number of practices. Again, we drew lactate before the warm-up, okay? So before the on-ice warm-up the guys conducted on the ice, after the on-ice warm-up, before the first period, after the first period, before the second, after the second, before the third, after the third, and on two different occasions, we actually had guys perform three different post-game routines, okay? Two different types of supposed lactate-clearing bike rides. Third group of guys went to the sauna, drank Coors Light, and, you know, talked about the game, right? That, that wasn't our protocol. That's just what they did. We told them to do whatever you want, okay? So I know you probably can't read this, and anyone who wants, you can email me and contact me. Um, Ed uh, McNeely uh, did present this before, before the uh, Canadian Society of Exercise Physiology. Uh, his intention was to publish it. I don't know if he did or didn't. Uh, but the interesting result, I'll read it off here if you, if you can't read it there, is that there was no difference in the lactate levels measured prior to the start of the game and at the beginning of each period. There's no difference in lactate levels at the end of each period. There was a significant decrease in lactate between the end of the second period and the start of the third. Uh, and most importantly, any lactate that was accumulated was not detrimental. It didn't have a detrimental effect to the carryover from one period to the next. So what we found was that do you generate lactate when you play hockey? Yes. Okay, you're generating lactate right now when you sit here and listen to me. It's just a, a very insignificant amount. Okay, is this hampering your performance? It's very tough, it's very tough to say you know, 100% for sure yes or no because we weren't measuring players during the period. Obviously, it's too, you know, it's too you know, invasive. Is it hampering your play over the course of a game? No, it's not. Is it hampering your play between two games? You know, and I've, I've heard about there's a concern with, with players and coaches when they have back-to-back -back games. The lactate, there's all the lactate. Absolutely not, okay? It's not affecting your performance in the next period. It's certainly not affecting your performance in a game tomorrow, right? Does that mean that lactate is good or bad? No, there's, there's no good, there's no bad, okay? Lactate can actually be very good, okay? We, as a part of this process, for four years as part of our preseason fitness testing, we did a test which is called the, the read repeat length skating test. What happens is the players will skate from the goal line, or about, you know, approximately about two feet inside the goal line to the far goal line, back across the near blue line, okay? Every 30 seconds they perform one repetition. They do six repetitions in total, all right? The goal of the test is, the length is to try to find a, a length of ice that when performed at maximum intensity, you can push the limit of the alactic system. Okay, so something that's going to take a player more than 9 or 10 seconds, less than 15 seconds of all-out, as hard as you can go, sprint activity, performed with insufficient rest. Okay? We had players with lactates as high as 20. Anyone who's studied lactates can appreciate that, or people, if you haven't, we had, I'll just say we had players that were super, super high. We had players that were super, super low. Very low correlation to speed. Okay? Very low correlation to the performance on the test. Very low correlation between the lactate levels that were generated in the tests and their success as players. Okay? So it's not good or bad. It's just a piece of information that you can use when you're planning training. So for lactate, something, these are the important things to understand. It's produced all the time. It's just a matter of how much and how you can deal with it. So it's not bad to generate a lot of lactate. Some of the fittest athletes that I know, uh, some of the Olympic rowers, Olympic boxers that I've seen, generate obscene amounts of lactate, but they're able to buffer it and deal with it. It's not a bad thing, all right? Lactate is not responsible for the burning sensation that you get during bouts of intense exercise. Okay, that's a big misnomer. Definitely not responsible for DOMS, okay, the soreness you have a day after workout. It's not because you have a lactate accumulation in your muscles. It can be useful as a source. So what we found is that players that had lactate that was too low, that's not a good thing. A lot of times these people just, they're not able to get the lactate out. They're not able to push it out of the system a lot, of these, a lot of the more unfit or unhealthy players actually had the lower lactates. Some of the fittest and healthiest players had the highest lactates. Uh, and again, it can be converted back into glucose. So lactate can be a fuel source. It can be a good thing. So getting back into specificity. Okay, how might anyone know how I'm doing on time? We good? I want to make sure there's some time for question and answer. Okay. So we get back to the slide we had before. What is hockey then? Okay. We, we talked about specificity. Okay, we talked about the need to always be able to say, why are you doing what you're doing? 
All right? Hockey is an open motor skill sport. So anyone that's not familiar with the term open versus closed skill, so uh, gymnastics, all right? rhythmic dance, sprinting and track and field. All right? unless, somebody is, unless there's the chance that a fan is going to come running across the track and tackle you in the middle of a 100 meter dash, otherwise it's, that's a closed sport. Olympic weightlifting, closed sport. You don't have to react to external stimulus. You don't have to react to changing environments. You don't have to react to another person. Okay, it's an, hockey is not like that, okay? Again, skating as fast as you can or skating around and around and around for 45 seconds is irrelevant, okay, if you're not reacting to external stimulus, if you're not involved mentally in the play. It's a multiple movement pattern sport, all right, on the ice. Again, this is a big, and this is um, a real tough area, and there's, there's lots of hot debates about this, how much time should guys spend on the ice in the summer, all right? I, I think, you know, I, I have, uh, I don't work with very many, uh, every year I take on, on, on one kid as sort of like a, a feeder into my program. I have, I have two kids now that are uh, between the ages of 14 and 16. 90% uh, of my clients are in their late 20s playing in the NHL, okay? If, I think for kids, they should spend a lot of time on the ice. With my NHL players, we spend a, we spend a lot of time off the ice. However, we do do energy systems training on the ice because that's where the sport is done, right? I'm not sure, and this is, uh, again, this could be a whole other presentation on this, but when, when you step outside your, your, your environment that you're in, okay, I've been very fortunate this year. This is the first year in eight years that, that I haven't been working with a team. Uh, I got to travel around and, and, and spend some time with some real top coaches in other places in the world. And you realize that a lot of the things that you do that you assume are the right things to do are sort of based on tradition more than they are based on science. I, when, I, when I discuss the concept of... of long, you know, steady distance aerobic training on bikes, which is a huge, huge trend in the NHL. I, I was very fortunate this year. I was invited by uh, the Welsh Rugby Union uh, to come over and spend some time with them. And it was the first North American coach that, that they allowed to come into their training facility. And they have some, the, the things they're doing with monitoring athletes and the physiology they're doing, it's, it's off the charts. I can just, I can't tell you a lot about it, but I can tell you that there's nothing that we're doing here in North America that even comes close. They, they were bl absolutely blown away when I described some of the training paradigms and philosophies that we did here, and it wasn't, it, they just couldn't, they couldn't comprehend why we would do it. You know, I, I, I've met with the, the track and field, uh, the former uh, track and field sprints coach with the Ukraine. He worked with sprints in middle distance, and genuinely was very interested and very keen to learn why the hockey players would ride bicycles and why we were doing VO2 max training. Not, not critical, just he was very curious as to why we would do that, and he wasn't sure, you know, from a physiological standpoint, why there would be any benefit to doing that. Okay. One thing that I think is, regardless of what your opinion is, whether you're doing your training on the ice, off the ice, it has to be in multiple movement patterns. Okay. Hockey is a collision sport, right? so all the energy systems training in the world okay, is irrelevant if you're injured and you can't perform. So you have to be able to prepare your athletes for that. Repetitive bouts of explosive power, we've talked about that with our, with our slide about alactic power training. Incomplete recovery intra-shift and complete recovery inter-shift. Again, this is, some, this, is, this is something that will be hotly debated about this complete recovery, but if, if you do your own time motion analysis, okay, and you're aware that a shift of hockey is a series of two to three second bursts of activity, and you go back to my very first slide when we got into our energy system section about what is alactic power training, okay, what are the work to rest ratios, you know that a typical player is going to get sufficient rest in between shifts. Okay, hockey requires power endurance. Okay, what is power? So power is the rate of force development. Okay, rate of force development is irrelevant without sufficient force in the first place. Okay, so hockey to be at, at the elite level to be fit for hockey requires you to be able to perform multiple bouts of explosive power. Okay, you can't worry about being able to perform multiple bouts of explosive power if you don't have any explosive power. Okay, you can't worry about having explosive power. Okay, if you don't have any strength. So a lot of this comes back, you have to break it down and, and start with first things first. Okay, you can, you can train for whatever you want to train for, you know, and this is the, like, I'm not, a, again, I'm not, a, you know, I'm not a, a pro powerlifting guy or a, an anti-Olympic lifting guy or a, a pro sprint guy and an anti-aerobics guy, okay? I don't train any marathon runners, I don't train any triathletes, right? If I did... Absolutely, we would do tons and tons of aerobic training. And if I had a triathlete, I, and I've never trained a triathlete, and I'm, I'm the furthest thing from an expert on that subject, if I had a triathlete, absolutely they would be on a stationary bike. 
I think it probably would be even better to be on a road bike because that would be more specific in my opinion, but again, maybe not, I don't know, I'm not an expert in that area. So whatever you're trying to do, you can accomplish whatever you want, but you've got to be specific to what you're doing. So if we look at our racing car here, okay, on the left, the tires that are on that car, the engine that are on that car are specific for, for the demands of the task. You know, I see a lot of players that, would sit, that will come in and say, I need to get bigger and stronger, right, which may or may not be relevant for the task. That's up to you as the coach working with your athletes to work together on goal setting to say, okay, you know what? If I put these giant tractor tires on this car, on this race car on the left, it's going to be, a little, it's going to be more stable. It's going to have better traction. Okay, but is it, is it still going to have a chance to win that race? Probably not. Okay, this big truck over here on the right is incredibly slow. If I want to make it faster, I can strip some of the parts off. I can put smaller tires on. I can take, but it's probably not going to be able to crush those cars. So whatever you, you can, you can do whatever you want. And again, I'm not saying you should train one way or the other. I'm just saying you need to sit down with your athletes, figure out what their goals are, and schedule your training accordingly. Okay. What are you training for? All right. I, I've seen a lot, and this is, it's getting better, I'd have to say, but again, back to like my conversation about the, the hockey player that wanted to train like a football player. I see hockey players that go in the summer and they train with a track and field sprint coach and do a sprinter's workout. They do the same workout that the sprinters do because sprinters are fast and they want to be fast on the ice. So I'm going to do what a sprinter does. Or, you know what? Olympic weightlifters are really powerful. So I'm going to train exactly like an Olympic weightlifter because they're powerful and I want to be powerful, so I'll do that. Or I need to get bigger and stronger, and this is, I mean, I certainly, when I was in high school, this was my thing. I'm going to go, I don't know what to do, so I'm going to go to the gym and I'm going to look for the biggest guy who looks, you know, he, this guy looks pretty macho and I'm going to do what he does. Because then I'll be big and strong and I, you know, I know guys in the NFL are big and strong, so that's what I should do. Really the answer is we should be training for hockey, but we don't know what that is. So that's sort of our job collectively in this room to raise the level of education, to raise the level of profession, and develop hockey training. What is hockey training? Okay, specificity of training we've talked about, all right? You need to address all these things in your training, all right? Look at the training programs you're writing for your athlete. Are they specific in all of these veins? Okay, the first one, specificity of movement patterns, all right? So up here, someone actually, you know, this slide was, uh, was made uh, two weeks ago, so long before uh, Floyd Landis came out and made the comments he made, but um, this is something that, uh, you know, again, having, uh, having gained a reputation as an anti-aerobic guy, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to qualify myself first by saying that I, I don't dislike Lance Armstrong. I, I think he's a, you know, he's a hero, and to a lot of people, cancer survivors, I think he's a fantastic person. I don't dislike bikes. I have a bike. I used to ride a bike to work before I could afford a car. I think bikes are great. They're a great mode of transportation. All right. Do I think that riding a stationary bike for hockey is the best way to train? No, I, I don't. Okay. This is probably the best example. And this is a, you know, recently uh, one, one team in the NHL decided to hire uh, a guy who was the, the coach or consultant for Lance Armstrong to be this team's aerobic fitness consultant and design training programs for them. So it, it was probably the best real life, you know, clinical research that you could possibly have on this subject, okay? Here is arguably the best triathlete, you know, marathon runner, cyclist in the world. He's been, he's been, good, at all, he's been good at all these things, but he's definitely the best bike rider, okay? He's the bit, you know, like, I guess you could argue, you know, I'm not, I, I'm not involved in cycling. I, I don't know anything about the sport, but I think if you asked 100 people on the street, who's the best cyclist in the world, probably most people are going to tell you Lance Armstrong. So, this was an opportunity to take the protocols, the principles, the systems that were used, supposedly, okay, to create the success that Lance Armstrong had and apply them for hockey players, right? The funny thing is, okay, even within Lance Armstrong, who, again, is a, is a phenomenal athlete, when Lance Armstrong tried to transfer his superb aerobic fitness to the sport of marathon running, he didn't have as much success as he did in cycling, okay? So these, these are two, two times here from Lance's performance in the New York City Marathon. Okay. All, I'm also going to say this too. I've never run a marathon in my life. I can't even imagine running a marathon. My brother's a marathon runner. I don't understand it. it I think it's like a mental sickness. But for me, I could, so anyone who's, who can even complete a marathon, walk it, jog it, run it, if you just completed it and you didn't, you didn't pass out and die, that to me is an accomplishment. So this is much better than I'll ever do. And I have the ultimate respect for him as a person okay, with all he's done also for having run a marathon. However, he finished in 856th place. Okay, now you have to remember, Lance, Lance's background is as a runner first, 
cyclist second. Okay, this is not something he just took up last week. Okay, he, he, he started out as a runner, transitioned into, into triathlon, transitioned to cycling. Okay, he bettered that time in Boston to, to 2 hours and 51, 488th place. Now, three hours is a respectable time, okay? And I think it's good. It, it's about as fast as my brother can run a marathon, and my brother's a good runner. And, he, you know, he's a, he's a high school principal, and, he, you know, he has, he, when he has some free time, he runs, and he's a pretty healthy guy, so I, I think it's a good time, okay? But... Is that what you would expect of an elite athlete who is, who is you know, at that pinnacle? No, okay? How come? How is that possible? Because they're two different sports, okay? Even if the energy system is, is the same or similar, it's a different movement pattern, okay? There's, a, there's an effect of specificity. Okay, Lance's comment here, nothing was as hard as that. Nothing left me feeling the way I felt in terms of sheer fatigue and soreness. That was without a doubt the hardest physical thing that I've ever done. It took me about four or five months to be able to run again. Okay, after running his marathon, right? Which is pretty incredible when you, when you imagine all the things that Lance was able to accomplish in the Tour de France, climbing those hills, the, the stress. You know, anyone who's worked, I, I, I've been very fortunate. I have a friend, who, a medical doctor, who works or has worked with a number of Tour de France cyclists. I know the things that they do to themselves, all right? Whether it's on the bike or in the massage van or whatever it is. The, the stress physiologically that they put on their bodies, you, you can't even possibly imagine. So for him to say this, that's pretty significant, okay? So even at the highest level, there's a specificity of movement patterns, okay? The specificity of energy systems, all right? Over distance training versus under distance training. So this is typically something that when you talk to hockey coaches, this is the concept, and I've heard this before, that you know, we're, you know, if, a, if a shift is 45 seconds, we're going to go hard for 90 seconds because if you can go hard for 90 seconds, then 45 seconds is going to feel easy. Okay, uh, yeah, I, I guess that sort, that sort of makes sense. But if that's the case, how should Lance Armstrong train for the Tour de France? How should a triathlete train? How should a marathon runner train? So we, have, we had at one point, we had an NHL hockey team who was performing bicycle rides for 90 minutes, four times a week, for a sport that I've already told you consists of 17 minutes of actual work time over the course of two and a half hours. The 17 minutes of work time is divided up into two to three second bursts, typically with anywhere from eight to 15 seconds recovery. So if you know those work to rest ratios, okay, and you translate that into marathon running, would that suggest that my brother should go out and run for 15 hours to prepare for a marathon? Should Lance Armstrong ride the bike for two days, then swim for a day, and then run for four days to prepare for a marathon? No, you wouldn't do that. You know, a track and field coach would never do that with a middle distance runner or a long distance runner because it's stupid, it doesn't make any sense, but for some reason we've fallen into that trap with hockey players. Okay, real, real important concept here, and this, this could be a whole day of lecturing uh, all by itself. Um, I'm reading a really good book right now that uh, I would highly recommend called The Brain That Changes Itself by Norman Doidge. Um, I've been very, very fortunate to, to see Oliver Sacks. Uh, speak. If anyone is not familiar with Oliver Sacks, have you seen the movie Awakenings with Robin Williams? That's a that's a story about this guy. The concept of, they, they talk about the concept of neural plasticity, okay? And there's also the concept of skeletal muscle plasticity. So your body, your muscles, your nervous system, you, you, it's highly plastic, it's highly adaptable, it's highly able to change, all right? Which is really, really cool, okay? When you're talking about like Norman Doidge's book, you're talking about people that are unable to stand, unable to walk, retraining them through training their nervous system to be able to walk again, having blind people see again, deaf people hear again. These are super exciting things, all right? From our lowly level, uh, you know, here we're talking about training, there's a, there, it's, it's a double-edged sword. It's good and it's bad. It means that you have a super, super high potential to improve your athletes with proper training, okay? On the other edge of that sword is that you have a super, super high potential to make your athletes worse if you do the wrong training, all right? So we know there's a specific effect to the movement patterns. We know there's a specific effect to the energy systems, and now we know that our, our nervous system is highly plastic. So if we take fast twitch, explosive athletes that perform a sport that requires multiple movement patterns, it's open motor skills, they require reaction, they require the ability to, to perceive the external environment and do things explosively, and we put them on stationary bikes and make them pedal mindlessly for 90 seconds, okay, you know that you're running the risk of affecting the plasticity and, and making these athletes worse. Okay? Regardless of what program you're doing, back to my very first point that I made in the talk, why are you doing what you're doing and is it working? Okay? 
If you like to ride the stationary bike, great. You should be able to defend why you're doing what you're doing. Not just, not just the, the time or the work, the rest. Why are you even on a bike in the first place? Or, or if, you're, if you're into sprints, why are you doing that? Okay? If you're into Olympic weightlifting, great. Why are you doing it? Okay? And then the bottom line, is it working? Okay? Not just is it working in the gym. This is a trap that I think a lot of strength coaches fall into, and I certainly did uh, like 10, 12 years ago when I was working privately. It was my goal as a private strength coach to have all my guys show up at training camp at their NHL teams and take their shirts off and people go, wow, what did you do all summer? And then to get in there and, and kill the tests at training camp. Because that for me was good business. Because if they kill the training camp tests and they look good, they're going to tell one of their buddies and then I got a new, guy, a new client for next summer. The only problem is the season doesn't start till October. The playoffs don't start till April. That, had, that was of no concern to me. Okay? And I never once, 12 years ago, spent two seconds watching any of these guys on the ice to see if the stuff that I was doing that made their bench press better or made their, you know, made their body look more buff or their squats go up, did that actually translate into better hockey performance? I didn't do that. That's something that I do now. Okay? So why are you doing what you're doing and is it working? If you can answer both of those questions positively, then do whatever you want. It's a good program to me. Okay? Hierarchy of off-season training. Okay? Again, I, told, I already told you that Tudor Bompa was my advisor for a year and a half when I did my master's program. He was also the first guy that I remember in uh, 1992, I, I read his book, Theory and Methodology of Training. Um, that to me was like a groundbreaking moment. You know, I was, I was you know, doing bodybuilding training, trying to get better for football. I did the same sort of training all year long. Okay? You can argue about whether you know, periodization, you know, linear periodization, conjugated periodization. Again, this goes back to the whole point I made about Charlie Francis and I know people that bash each other and say really, really detrimental things on a personal level about different coaches because they believe in one system or another. I, I, I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. So would I say that I, would, do I, do I do now do classical periodization with all my athletes the way that I learned it from Tudor? No, I do not. Right? Does that mean that it wasn't relevant to me at the time? Absolutely, it was relevant. So I start every summer with restoring health. Okay? There's no set timelines. There's no, I don't have phase one is May, phase two is this, phase two is that. I can think of, I, I had an athlete last year who uh, basically came to me, he, he, had, he was an NHL hockey player who was on his way out of the league due to injuries, all right? He had had uh, sports hernia, hip labrum surgery, so the goal for our summer was to get healthy. So uh, we, we agreed to the fact that if together, working together, we were able to get him to be the worst player in the National Hockey League who was actually physically able to play for 82 games, that would be a step in the right direction. And then we could chip away at the fitness after that, all right? So there might be some players that show up, and I haven't met too many of them, but there might be some players that show up at my gym next week. I do my screen, no issues, okay? They're balanced, good strength, no injuries. We jump right into the next phase of training. I might have other players that are doing rehab, prehab in August, two weeks before they go back to training camp, all right? You can't, you know, you can't go to grade one until you've passed kindergarten, all right? So there's, there's no timeline on these, but this is where it always has to start, okay? Hypertrophy and strength. Um, this is based on individual need. My, my opinion on this, again, I don't, I, I don't work with very many NCAA hockey players or high school hockey. I, I work predominantly with NHL hockey players. So my philosophy of training has changed in the last four years when the game at the NHL level has changed. Okay? And for those of you who don't know, there were real changes put in place. There's less hooking and holding. Uh, there's certain players. You know, I, I have one player that used to play at you know, between 250 and 260 pounds was his playing weight. He now plays between 230 and 240. Okay? We used to do more hypertrophy training because it was, he was able to manhandle guys and hook and hold and wrestle. He can't do those sorts of things anymore. Okay? Less relevant okay, from a hypertrophy standpoint. Uh, again, you could argue that um, if, you, if you're into classical periodization, you need to follow a hypertrophy phase before you get to a maximum strength phase. I haven't found that to be the case at the level of athletes that, that I work with. And I, can, I can even speak to my, uh, probably my bobsledder is the best example of this. We, would, we spent, I, you know, rough, rough estimate, 80, you know, 80 percent of our time over the two and a half years we worked together in the very first phase of restore health, rehab, prehab. Okay, we squatted, we back squatted probably three or four times and front squatted maybe four or five times uh, over the course of two years. Uh, every year, her front squat, they, in bobsled in Canada, we test front squat. Uh, her front squat went up every year. She's 160 pounds. She can front squat 279 pounds. 
Okay, strong, strong, strong girl. Okay, we didn't, we didn't get that by following the classic model. So is that because of some special program I did? Absolutely not, okay. She had the capability of doing that always. It's just a matter of you have to make sure that her system is physically ready to handle that load, okay. We talked about, you know, this whole idea of conversion to power. It's a, doing power training or doing power intervals or a lot of these things are irrelevant if they don't have a sufficient level of maximum strength. So again, with the two young kids that I work with, you know, we're, we're trying to learn some technique on, on some Olympic lifts, whether it's dumbbell, barbell, whatever it may be, right? But it's irrelevant to overload them at that age because a lot of them just have insufficient levels of maximum strength. And, that, and again, this is my opinion. Okay, power endurance is the final phase. So again, when I worked privately 12 years ago, I was, and maybe some of you do this too, I was looking at the annual plan for my athletes under a microscope like this. Okay, I would see guys, they typically show up in May, they go back to their team, fly back to wherever city they live in in September. I did an annual periodization within three months so that they were peaked and ready. They were at maximum capacity and potential for the first day of training camp, right? Which I've since learned is probably a really bad idea, okay? When there's no really important games until October and then the most important games are in April. So that doesn't mean that I don't do power endurance training. That just means that I now have the confidence you know, I'm very comfortable with what I do that if I have to keep an athlete in the restore health phase all summer, I do it. I do what's right. Why are you doing, again, why are you doing what you're doing and is it working? So I don't feel pressured now to say, okay, well, geez, it's August and this guy really doesn't have good mechanics yet and he's still got, you know, he's still got a tracking issue and, and this thing's not firing right, but we got to do intervals because it's August. I, I, I just don't do that, okay? So it has to follow that progression. Since we talked about power being the predominant energy system and what we need for hockey, this is my hierarchy of power development. Okay? Before you worry about how much a guy can clean or how fast he can sprint or how high he can jump, okay, is, he, uh, is he able to absorb force? So before you worry about what load you're going to apply, okay, is it ethical for you to apply load to this person? You know, are they able to withstand the load you want to put on them? So we work on training the ability to absorb force before we work on the ability to produce force. Okay? So before we worry about repetitive plyos and boundings and things like that, can you stand on one leg? Okay, can you do that? Can you do it properly? Can you squat properly? With, forget about the load. Forget about how much can you squat. Can you squat? All right? If we're going to jump up and down off boxes or bound down a track, I want to make sure that you can land properly the first time when you're fresh. Otherwise, it's really irrelevant how many times you can do it. All right? Then we, we have to train the ability to produce force. Okay, so again, we talked about that. Um, there's there's some people that are of the opinion that uh, you don't need to do any power training or any plyometric type training or any sprint training. You, uh, this is sort of like a, a Tudor Bompa thing. You just get stronger and practice hockey. If you just get stronger and practice hockey, everything will work together. I think that's probably a better approach than riding a bike for 90 minutes, but it's not the best approach. Right? I think there does need to be some integration and there needs to be a, a conversion to power phase. Okay? So once we have our strength, we build some power, then and only then, can you worry about being able to sustain power? So nobody cares if you can play really, really lousy for three periods of hockey and feel refreshed at the end of it. Okay? I would rather have a player that goes out and scores four or five goals in the first period and then he's exhausted for the rest of the game. Most coaches would agree they'd rather have that guy. Okay? My first phase of the summer okay, starts with assessment. All right? This is an a old Paul Check quote. If you're not assessing, you're guessing. Uh, we develop a hierarchy of needs. This is individual to each athlete, all right? When I work with older athletes, it's as simple as asking them. They can tell you, you know, I've got, you know, I've got two clients right now. I've got one that's uh, 39 and one that's 37, still playing in the NHL, one guy after 16 years. Okay, they know exactly what they need at this point, you know? Some guys just, they're just trying to hold on. Some guys need to get faster. Some guys need to get bigger. Some guys, they can give you real good, specific, objective numbers. Some guys can just give you real good qualitative information about you know, I, I need to be better when I'm opening up to my left. I can't do that. Whatever it is, okay? That's a, you sit down and you set those goals with your client. Okay, this comes into that first, you know, that old saying, you can't make the club in the tub. So it doesn't matter how much you can bench or squat or how fast you can run a 40 or how fast you can do the re repeat length skating test if you're hurt all the time, okay? The first goal is you have to be physically available to be in the lineup before you can worry about how good you are on the ice. Okay, this is so in a, in a classical periodization model, this is the anatomical adaptation phase. Or as a, a good friend of mine who's the, in charge of the Swedish Olympic training program used to say, you have to train to be able to train. Train to develop the ability to train. 
Okay, phase two, this is, you know, typically uh, in a conjugated model or what people talk about now is GPP. I'm working on building athletes, not hockey players. So, uh, again, I'm not, it's not my goal. And now, especially privately, when I was with the team, I would have guys all year round. Now I have some of these guys, I, ha I still have a, a couple of private clients that are still playing in the playoffs. So hopefully I don't see them for another month, you know, but either way, I get a very limited amount of time with these guys. So there's a lot of things you want to accomplish. It's unrealistic to accomplish it in the amount of time that I'll have in the summer, right? So the first and foremost, we have to get them healthy. And then we're just trying to improve athletic ability. So not specific hockey abilities in this phase, all right? Uh, Mel Siff probably had the best definition of functional training that I've ever heard, okay? And again, this is so again, I'm, Paul Check is a friend of mine. And uh, him, him and Mel spent, you know, much of Mel's life, who's also passed and no longer with us, bashing each other and criticizing each other, which is a huge waste of time. So Paul, even though he's the functional training guy, Mel Siff had the best definition. Any training that you do that improves any relevant biomotor ability, that's functional training. Okay, whatever it is. Okay, so if you can make a case for the fact that riding a stationary bike has, has improved a biomotor ability that is critical to your success, great, do it. Okay, if you work on flexibility all summer and never touch a weight, and that improves a relevant biomotor ability that does not come at the detriment of any other relevant biomotor ability, that's functional training. Okay, so basically anything you do that makes your athlete better at hockey without making any of the other biomotor abilities worse is functional training. Okay, it doesn't mean you have to be standing on a ball or balancing, you know, standing on your head on a BOSU ball and juggling steak knives. Okay, however, if that somehow makes you better at hockey, great, do that. Just make them sign a waiver first. Phase three, okay, this is the conversion to power phase. This is something now, I, I have all of my athletes, for, the, for example, my NHL guys for the month of August, we're on the ice, all right? We transition all the things that we do from the track, from the field, onto the ice. This is a change for me, okay? 12 years ago when I first started working with NHL players, I didn't do anything on the ice for two reasons. A, I didn't have ice, or probably three reasons. B, I can't skate, even if I did have ice, right? And I couldn't afford to hire a coach. And C, then it becomes less about me because... If it's all on the ice and it's ha happening with another coach, well, now I'm just, I'm sitting in the background. It's not my show anymore. So from an ego standpoint, it wasn't as good for me, right? I, I'm kind of, I've been around, uh, I guess, long enough now and I've done enough now that I don't, I don't really care about that. I hired two coaches to do my on-ice stuff. They're fantastic, okay? I sit down with them and tell them, I explain to them, here's, here's what I want to do from an energy systems training perspective. Can you, what do you think are some, like, and I'll come to them. And I'm, I'm like, I'm a bit of a, a geek with, with this stuff. Like, I'll come and say, hey, I had this really cool idea, like we could do this and we could, a drill, we could do a drill that does this and, and I, I'm lucky, like the, the coach that runs my on ice, you know, he's a, a good friend of mine, I've known him since high school, he played for a long time in the NHL, he coached at the American League level, he can turn to me and say, you know what, that's a really stupid idea and I'll tell you why, like, in, that doesn't happen in hockey, here's what we need to do. So we're able to have that conversation and then it's his show on the ice, right? So that's something that's changed for me because again, normally I only have these guys for three months I'm greedy. I want every second of their time for three months. I'm trying to accomplish so many things in three months. It has to happen over here with me. And if, if it has to happen on the ice, that takes away from my time in the, in the gym, on the track. But when I kind of divorced myself from that idea and just said, you know what? The most important thing is the result for the player. Now I realize that we have to do our energy system training on the ice because that's more specific. That's where they play. You know, again, Lance Armstrong wouldn't spend three months in the summer skating to improve his ability to ride a bike. Michael Phelps doesn't spend three months in the summer swimming, you know, if, if he's trying to be better at bike riding, right? If I want to study geography to pass a history test, bad idea, okay? So if I'm going to play hockey, I need to be doing some of this training on the ice. It only makes sense. And it's, again, it's only when you step outside the world of hockey and talk to other coaches around the world that you realize how asinine the idea is that you would train this way. Okay, so... If we know that there's a specificity effect, we know that skeletal muscle is highly plastic, and we know what the demands of hockey are, what's the problem? Okay? I, I think uh, the biggest problem is that hockey is predominantly ruled by people that play the sport and have an emotional attachment to the sport. They're, they're influenced by tradition and history. You know, this is what I did. This is what everybody else did. This is what Wayne Gretzky did. You know, Mary Lemieux didn't do this, and Wayne Gretzky didn't do that. And, you know, and like, I, I've, heard, I've heard every... Every possible argument that you could have for not doing training, you know, when they, as soon as they start making the puck heavier, I'll start working out with weights. Or, uh, you know, I've heard every possible reason you could have for not lifting weights, for not sprinting, for not doing all these sorts of things, okay? 
but eventually you're going to have to ask yourself, okay, if we want to move forward collectively as a group and we don't want people going around uh, hiring sprint coaches and Olympic lifting coaches and football trainers to train their hockey players, we want them to hire hockey strength coaches to train their hockey players, we need to get better as a group and we need to raise the level of what we do. So, again, I don't care what kind of training you do, I, I, you know, and I, and I hope you, know, you don't take what I'm saying as gospel and just go for it. That should be the whole point of my presentation. I specifically did not give you uh, uh, workouts that this is what I do, this is what you should do. I don't think that's the case. I think you need to take some time, like I did, okay, look at your athletes at your sport. You know, NCAA hockey, slightly different energy demands than NHL hockey. You know, high school hockey, slightly different demands than NCAA hockey. Women's hockey, you know, I haven't worked with uh, a lot of women's hockey players. I'm not a women's hockey training expert. You know, maybe these things I'm telling you don't work as well for women's hockey. I, I don't know. What I'm telling you is you need to take that time and study your sport, become an expert in your sport. So here's a real simple thing we talked about. Are you do, why are you doing what you're doing and is it working? Here's a really simple checklist that you can go down when you look at any of your programs. If I left a, a program of mine on the floor and left this room, I should feel very confident that if Jim picked it up or Sean picked it up or Chris picked it up, they'd pick up that program and whether or not they, they would choose those exercises or whether or not that's exactly what they would do, they would be able to look at that program and go, Okay, I see what's happening. Okay, yeah, that's fine. I, I, it's not what I would do, but I like that. That'll work. That's good. Okay, if you, if you can do that, you're cool. All right. Is the exercise you're prescribing closed chain? Now this, okay, first, rehab. This is not rehab. This is training. Okay, so forget about that. And we can argue about that. Okay, is the exercise that you're doing for your energy systems training in the off season, is it closed chain? Yes or no? Okay. Is it acyclic? Okay, what does that mean? Okay. Jogging, elliptical machine, rowing machine, stationary bike, repetitive cyclical activity. Okay, hockey, acyclic. Okay, react, adjust, move, turn, twist, hit, receive a hit, shot, pass. Okay, is, is the energy systems you're training an open motor skill? Okay, 12 years ago, my go to was 400 meter repeat intervals. Okay, that progressed to 300s, to 150s to hundreds, to short shuttles. Okay, now as much as possible in our energy systems training, we incorporate reaction into the drill. How am I doing on time, Dan? You just cut me off when you're... Okay, are we good or should we... Okay, good. So, okay, I'm done. You can read that. That's, that's real quick. Okay, any, do, let's open up for questions, if there's any questions right now. Anything? Zero? That means I did either really good or really bad. Yeah? Okay, I always... I start with... Uh, um, if an athlete came in, if, if you came in tomorrow to see me, uh, we, start, we start on the table, okay, joint assessment, range, range of motion, really, really basic orthopedic testing. I do manual muscle testing uh, somewhere in between, you know, applied kinesiology and MAT. Somewhere, you know, I've, I've studied uh, both a little bit and, you know, I'm not an expert on either, but somewhere in between that. If there's any issues there, just like my hierarchy of training, if there's any failures, issues there, we're done. We don't train. We don't, no, there's no more functional testing. I refer out immediately. I have a, a network of, of guys that I work with. Automatically, they go to see them. Okay? If they're able to pass all the orthopedic screens, manual muscle testing, uh, we do function, uh, I, I use elements of the functional movement screen. I think there, there's certain elements of that test that are fantastic. There's certain elements of that test that I, I, I don't think are super relevant. Um, and then after that, we have just a few little basic functional movement pattern screens that we do. I don't do any uh, you know, 1RM testing, speed testing like that at that point in the summer just because it's been my experience. I'm open to doing it. I've just never, ever, ever had an NHL player come to me in May with not some residual level of excessive tightness, weakness. Some, you know, I've, I've got a guy who's, who has a, uh, doesn't, I won't mention the team, but he, he had a grade 3 AC separation in, on December the 27th that has never been rehabbed. He was never prescribed one corrective exercise by his team therapist strength coach. He received nothing other than ice, for, for the injury, and he wasn't, uh, I mean, I'm just, I'm just getting to know this guy. He wasn't, you know, the kind of guy to either go outside the team or look. So I've got to now, we've got to go back now. It doesn't matter, you know, how fast he is or how he can jump. This is limiting his, his ability to play, you know. So without painkillers, he's unable to perform, right? So, uh, you know, does that sort of make sense? So once we get past that phase, uh, you know, we do a lot of other testing. I use a myo test. I use tendos. We you know I use stopwatches. We measure time. I, I don't do, I used to do uh, 1RM uh, kind of testing. I don't do that anymore. 
I, I, I'm, getting, I'm getting old, I'm getting soft, so I don't want to, and, and I'm working privately now, so I'm covering my ass to a certain extent, but also, again, like my, my, my girl who did bobsled, she, she's capable of probably, she probably is capable of squatting over 300 pounds, and this is not, this, this is a tall, slender, pretty girl who's just capable of generating a lot of power, right? I don't need to test that on a regular basis. I know she's capable of doing it. I just need to make sure she's healthy enough to do it when it matters. Does that answer your question? Okay. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>